Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Digital Marketing 101, a toolkit for online engagement. My name is Severia and I'm the Communications Manager for Transforming Youth Outdoors, also known as TYO. For those of you that are new to us, TYO was created to scale the impact of outdoor youth development and transform the lives of youth by providing best practices, tools, and support to individuals and organizations working with the youth in the outdoors, such as yourselves. We are a free technology platform that enables those in the field of outdoor youth programming to learn, share, network, and build upon successes. Membership to TYO is free, and you can sign up at mytyo.org. Our webinar series is just one of the many ways that TYO connects you to experts and valuable learning opportunities. For today's webinar, we welcome back Jen Lamboy and Jeff Moser from Mooncut Mountain Creative. Jen and Jeff specialize in crafting relevant, engaging, and unique content for outdoorsy companies. They're also hosting the Digital Marketing and Content Strategy Gathering on TYO, which you should definitely check out. But today, they're going to help fill your digital marketing toolbox with valuable and much-needed tools. Jen and Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Severia. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff. Hi, and I'm Jen. And we are uh, Mooncut Mountain Creative. We are Colorado-based right here in the lovely city of Denver. And I uh, want to thank uh, TYO for inviting us here for the webinar today. We also want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in to today's webinar. And hopefully over the next 60 minutes, we'll make digital marketing seem less intimidating. Our aim with this 101 approach is to briefly give you a better understanding of digital marketing and then dig into some of our insights on the tools that we use and the rules that we play by as digital marketers as well as web enthusiasts. So specifically, we are going to cover the six types of digital content relevant to the outdoor audience, tips and tools for shareworthy relevant content creation and curation, and then making sense of digital marketing strategies along with seven easy ways to get started. So from a high level, digital marketing refers to any of your marketing efforts that take place online, connecting you with your audience. So there are three key components to this and they include targeting, interacting, and measuring. So you've got your audience, these are the unique segments of the target market, your engagement, which is the right place, right time methods of interaction, and then your result, the metrics and analytics that you're going to use to measure your success. And it's really that last piece, the ability to accurately and immediately measure the result, that sets digital marketing far apart from more traditional marketing channels, such as print, radio, you get the picture. So back to those three key components to better articulate how they relate to each other, I kind of want to use a fishing um, example. To, to illustrate. So suppose you've got a fisherman who casts his net with the intention of catching a certain type of fish. When he pulls his net in and takes note of what he caught, he can use this info to better inform his next cast. He's using real-time data to influence his next move. So the means with which you can reach your audience and catch their attention vary. Think websites, email, social media platforms, search engines such as Google, Bing, even paid versus organic search. Using these digital channels should be part of a larger strategy. And the strategies worth noting that fall under the umbrella of digital marketing include, and there are many here, um, search engine optimization or SEO. This has to do with how well you communicate with the search engines such as Google and Bing on what your site is about so that they can determine your authority on a given topic and then reward you with high-ranking search results. The second is search engine marketing or SEM and this includes paid search so Google AdWords is typically the one that most associated with paid search and that's where you compete for placement and sponsored listings and although we're covering it here we're not going to cover it too much more in the webinar but if you have questions on paid search we can certainly get to those in the live Q&A that follows. Uh, the next one, content marketing, this encompasses a variety of digital assets that you create as an organization such as web pages and posts, videos, images, infographics, podcasts and Jeff will cover all of these in detail along with those tools that we mentioned. Social media marketing is the next one, and this is your plan for broadcasting, interacting, and building a following on social platforms. Email marketing. 
This covers your e-newsletters, your updates, your promotions, and your other communications via email. And then the last one is PR and online reputation management. And this is one that some people aren't too familiar with, at least the latter part of that. And this is your earned online coverage. So this includes reviews, online content written about you, such as mentions in articles or press releases. And for the main portion of this webinar, what we also won't cover is um, affiliate marketing or marketing automation using CRM software, although both are certainly included under the online marketing umbrella. So again, if you have questions on those two, just save them for the live Q&A following the webinar, or you can email us directly too. So how do you know where to start? There's so many strategies, um, and they certainly intertwine. But by first getting a basic understanding of how they can benefit your organization, matched with an understanding of your greatest needs, you, begin, you can begin determining where to start. And a great analogy for this is opening a store. Think of like a retail store. So your first step is to ensure that the building is up to code. Then you begin mapping out a floor plan for where you um, might display your goods. Then you start filling the shelves with your goods. You increase the staffing to help customers, and then you open your doors, and you make a bigger effort to get the word out about your store. So how does that relate to digital marketing? Let's think of it in digital marketing terms. The building inspection is where you take an audit of your site. You eliminate any search engine snags, and you get a good grasp of the online competitive landscape, basically SEO and SEM, and we'll dig into those tools a little bit later as well. So mapping your floor plan for your store is much like mapping a plan for content development or content expansion. Filling your shelves equals creating content with a team of contributors. And getting the word out about your store is the online take for social media, email marketing, and online reputation management. Now a mistake that I often see is when clients fail to get that order correct when they fail to establish that foundation that I just mentioned. And they implement, for example, a social media strategy way before they've cleaned up their site to make for a more positive user experience, or in the absence of any continuous plan to create new content. And if you know anything about search engine optimization, uh, the search engines love new content. It, it invites them to recrawl your site and perhaps index more of your pages. But with SEO, I get it. And with social media, I get it. Most people feel pressured to have a presence on social media, but without building a solid foundation and some really clear goals on what you want to accomplish with social, you could really be wasting your resources. And we can get into that a little bit too, um, again, in the live Q&A. Really getting that order down depends on where you are in that cycle of digital marketing. So the key in all of this is knowing which online marketing tactics to use in order to reach your goal. Or another way to look at it is based on all of the goals of your organizations, which ones can be attained with the help of digital marketing. And it might take a digital marketing expert to kind of point those things out to you, but some of them, very generally speaking, might be, one, you want to generate more buzz about your brand or your organization and the relevance of your work. And relevance is really key there, especially in the online world. Number two, you want to more effectively engage and interact with your audience. That's also assuming that you know your audience as well. And then the third, you want to increase either revenue, funding, or support. And in the grand scheme of things, organizations employ digital marketing techniques to help them further their mission. It just comes down to that. This often starts with creating and building an online identity or web presence. So think of it as a digital storytelling method where you use different types of content to paint a picture about yourself or your audience. Then from there, you build awareness, preference, and search engine authority. So more simply put, your digital means to cultivate, you're using digital means to cultivate an emotional connection with your audience member not only endearing them to your cause, but also driving a particular action. And you are strategically joining an existing online conversation as a relevant and noteworthy contributor. And when I say driving a particular action, I really just mean what do you need your audience to do to help you fulfill a goal? 
perhaps to get you one step closer to that mission that you've detailed. So that means you have to be a lot less foggy on three things. What are you trying to accomplish? Who can help you get there? Which digital marketing tactics make the most sense for reaching your goals? So if your organization is a nonprofit, for example, trying to get more kids outdoors, you're probably also aiming to increase funding, gain and retain supporters, maybe spark enthusiasm in your followers to help you spread the word about you and the relevance of your work. So the good news is digital marketing is ideal for doing all of that. Plus, with minimal knowledge, you can test just how well each initiative is working. The bad news is it's easy to make expensive mistakes if you don't know how to use digital marketing tactics to your advantage. And that's really why we put together this webinar. We want to help you navigate this vast, ever-changing landscape. Whether digital marketing piques your interest, like it does ours, or whether you reluct it reluctantly lands on your to-do list. And in the online world, this all boils down to content, but not only that, also the consumption of content. So let's discuss the top six types, again, as they are relevant to those in the outdoor world, some tips on creating valuable, shareworthy, and easily digestible material, and then a handful of tools to simplify the content creation process. And we'll start with the most basic form of content, which is text. Text, or what is also called words or copy, is the foundation of every website. It serves two massively huge purposes. One, it tells visitors what you're about. And two, it determines your website's ranking. For just as bees are attracted to nectar, Google is attracted to keywords. Keywords are the words or phrases that people use when searching a particular topic online. And the more keywords found in your copy, the better your website's chance of a first page ranking. And this is the basis of search engine optimization, or SEO, as Jen talks about. And so when you're putting together your text, I have some three tips to consider. One, aim for a minimum of 400 words per page, a minimum. Google pays attention to word counts when it comes to rankings. Two, uh, keep in mind that Google does not rank websites, but rather web pages. Each page represents a chance to generate better rankings. So don't limit your ranking potential by focusing only on your landing page. You see a lot of people do this. Give each page equal emphasis in creating great keyword rich copy, including even your contact page. And three, keep in mind that online visitors are not readers, but skimmers. So keep your text uh, so keep your text skimmer friendly. Uh, you can do this by using catchy uh, headlines, composing short paragraphs, and employing bullet points. Uh, as you see here, here's one of the snippets of one of our blog posts. And then back to this page so we can cover some of the tools. Here are a few content curation tools to help you find relevant content that you can broadcast on social media when you don't have time to create your own. And I'll say that again, when you don't have time to create your own content, that doesn't mean that you don't that you don't that you no longer participate in the game, right? You're still sharing relevant content. So these three tools for content curation include Feedly, Scoop It, and Capost. And here is a screenshot of Feedly and some sample options. So some of these, Feedly included, work much like a news or an RSS feed where you select the resources or sites from which you want a tool to pull the content. Then they feed you a stream of the latest and most relevant stuff to pick from. This really plays into your larger content marketing strategy though, for which I use some pretty detailed Google spreadsheets to help clients map out the content creation process. And oftentimes it's a combination of content that's originally crafted by organizations plus a mix of this curated content. And again, this is something I can cover in the live Q&A if that's of, of, of interest and there's time toward the end. Next, images. Photos are your website's handshake and smile. Uh, they're what visitors to your website first notice. The more appealing the photo, the better your chance of creating a favorable first impression and ultimately boosting visitor engagement. Statistics prove this. Text accompanied with images attract 94% more views than text without images. Studies show that visitors are more inclined to contact organizations and or businesses that display an image when their content appears in search results. And according to a Stanford University study, 46% of people base a website's credibility 
on its visuals. So if you're in the website's planning stage and want to revamp your visuals or images, uh, consider using uh, these three tips. One, choose photos that tell your story with your target audience in mind. A photo of a stunning sunset along the Oregon coast may look spectacular, but if your website's intent is to attract support by saving Nebraska's prairie dogs, the photo serves no purpose. Instead of engaging visitors, it only confuses, bordering on false advertising. According to studies, it takes less than two-tenths of a second for a first-time visitor to form an opinion of your website. So the faster a photo tells your story, the more likely of capturing the attention of your intended audience. Two. People connect with emotion. Choose photos that convey emotions that reflect your cause or business. TYO does a fantastic job of this on its website, showing happiness, contentment, excitement, and trust amongst its participants. And three, aim for being authentic. If possible, use your own images. Uh, this assures uniqueness for your website. Otherwise, if you need photos, there are plenty of online stock photo companies with great selections allowing you to match the feel and tone of your website. And I know there's a misnomer out there. It's like, my goodness, don't use stock photos. But some of these websites really do a great job of uh, providing a great selection to choose from to keep uh, your website unique. In general, touch on this a uh, little bit later. So if you're a Shutterbug or lack the budget to hire a professional photographer, fortunately there are some great online tools to help through websites and images. And I have two rules of thumb when it comes to online images. This is specifically in regard to search engine optimization. That's kind of my world that I really love to dig into. So the first is you want to reduce the file size as much as possible while still maintaining good uh, web photo quality. So reduce the file size. Two, is use a consistent naming convention that quickly and clearly describes what the user sees. And this is where I see a lot of clients make mistakes. So for example, if you're going to use Headshot for your About Us or your team's bio page, include the name of your organization in the naming convention and also use the, the full name of that team member, both of those in the, fi in the file name. And there are some great and often free online image editors that don't require prior knowledge or experience with more sophisticated tools such as Photoshop. For example, Pixlr. Here's the uh, screenshot of the resizing tool of my top pick. And this is also my daughter hitting a pinata at her snow-covered birthday party last year. But you can see how easy the interface is to use. They don't um, incorporate layers unless you use a different version of Pixlr, but you have that option to pick which direction you want to go right when you go to the home page of their website. So I like Pixlr. I really do. Although limited in functionality, because it's free and it's easy to use. Canva is another popular option that has more features but I personally like the quality rendered with Pixlr much more. And then when it comes to stock images, as Jeff mentioned, you don't want photos that look too staged. That's why I like Comp Fight. You'll see that as the third tool right there on the, on the screen. It also is free as long as you credit the author and they give you the code to embed that, embed that in your web pages. And it pulls photos from Flickr. So oftentimes you get a mix of professionally snapped images and those taken from regular Joes. Next, video. Video is no longer reserved for companies with huge marketing budgets. Thanks to advances in technology and editing software on tablets and iPads, videos can be shot, edited, and embedded in the same amount of time it takes to compose a blog. The benefits of video content are undeniable. According to Comscore, adding an optimized video to your website can increase the chance of a first page listing by 53%. Consumers are 39% more likely to share a video than a blog. 65% of viewers watch more than three quarters of a video, while according to Nielsen, visitors only read 20% of the words contained on the average web page. And 72% of businesses that use content video have claimed increased website conversion rates. So, if you're thinking of making a video, consider these three using these three tips. First, map out a set of goals you hope to achieve with the video. Is it instructional? Is it an appeal for donations? Are you just trying to give your or are you just trying to give your organization organization a face? This will give your video direction before shooting and help forge a tight to the point script. Two, keep it short. Aim for under two minutes. Everyone has two minutes. Anything longer causes visitors to think, "Man, oh, geez, I don't know if I have time for this." 
To understand this, think of how you feel when deciding between two similar TED Talks. If one is four minutes and the other is seven minutes, you generally opt for the shorter video. And three, keep it simple. Don't suddenly think you're Martin Scorsese. You need to make an award-winning video with incredible production. Keep in mind the intent of the video, the need to engage your visitor with useful content. Unfortunately, there's some really great tools out there uh, that make it easy uh, to produce and uh, to uh, produce, edit, and uh, get a video onto your website. If you're a Mac user, iMovie's great. It's one of the easier video tools on the Mac market. Um, depending on how creative you want to get, it allows you to add transitions, musics, music, and filters. There's also Wii Video. Uh, it allows you to edit from your browser while having access to its many features that include storyboard editing, timeline editing, screencasting, and voiceovers. It offers four different pricing plans ranging from free to $69. And if you really want to get creative, there's also Powtoon. Uh, this, and it deals with animation. Powtoon comes with a great reputation. It's easy to use and comes with an intuitive interface that guides you through each step of the video making process. It also allows you to export your video to YouTube in just a couple of clicks. Powtoon does offer a free version, but it comes with a uh, watermark and up to five minutes of video, but it also has watermark free plans, which start at $18 per month. Next, infographic. An infographic, as the name implies, is a graphic containing information. Its online popularity stems from its ability to present complex information in a format that's easy to understand, visually engaging, and often fun to read. In many ways, it's kind of like giving complex information a personality makeover, changing them from ho-hum to being the life of the party, or better, the life of your website. For example, here's an infographic on the threat climate change poses to coral reefs. Even though it addresses complex topics like greenhouse gases, sedimentation, and ocean acidification, it grabs attention. It's understandable and possesses the coveted share factor. If the same information was presented in text on a website, it would get lost, glazed over by the casual visitor, giving them little reason to stop and read. So some tips for uh, an infographic. One, don't go overboard with information. Design your infographic with your target audience in mind. Only provide the information that relates to them. Otherwise, you dilute the effectiveness and diminishes its shareability. And shareability is a big thing you're going after. Two, just because it's a graphic, don't underestimate the power of a killer headline. A good headline should be short, describe the infographic, and be able to seize attention. And three, keep it balanced between text and graphics. The text delivers the information while the graphics attract attention. An infographic with balance moves the viewer through the thought process, both cognitively and visually, letting a story-like flow. And oftentimes, budget plays a huge part in determining your options. For example, if your budget allows, your best bet might to be to hire a unique designer. And I've worked with a couple of folks who do really great work. If you want to, um, I can make an introduction if you'd like, just to kind of have an idea of who's out there um, that we have experience with. Also, the price range is going to vary, of course, with some designers and some charge by the project or by the hour. Um, but again, if you, want a, if you want an introduction, we certainly have a couple folks that we like to work with who do awesome work. And then there's two other somewhat more out-of-the-box options. Those include Visually, which starts at 3000 and Easily. Or there's Pictochart, and here's a screenshot of of um, one of their pages and some of their options for templates. So Pictochart is great if you want to take a stab at creating your own. The site offers some templates that you can use for free with a 30-day trial, or you can upgrade and access a bigger variety of pre-designed options. Next on the content, podcasts. A podcast is a unique form of content in that it's strictly audio, requiring nothing more than a computer, an external microphone, headphones, and recording software. It's like having your own radio station, allowing you to share your expertise in a personalized manner. Uh, no special recording studio is needed. You can record anywhere there's an internet connection. Comedian Mark Marin, whose podcast averaged 6 million downloads per month, records from inside his garage on a fold-out table. And he has had such guests as uh, President Barack Obama and... Uh, 
Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. So the advantage of podcasts is that they're easy to consume. Your audience can listen to them at any device while driving, working out, riding a subway, whatever. And because part podcasts are in a shareable files, people can access them 24-7 at their own convenience. They're on demand. Because of this convenience, 32 million people listen to podcasts monthly. And don't think they need to be tech-savvy to create a podcast. There are plenty of online tutorials to guide you through the process. Once you create a podcast, you'll be shocked at the ease. It, just to give you an idea here of uh, what involves a podcast, if you're unfamiliar, uh, in its most basic form, this is how it works. Step one, you write a script. It can be a one-person show or, to make it more dynamic, include guest interview. In case you wanted, that's Mark Marin in the picture right there. Step two, you record the podcast on your com computer. Step three, you save the recorded audio file in an MP3 format. In step four, you upload it to a podcast hosting site, and boom, there you are. You have a podcast ready for listening. You can then use Twitter, Facebook, or even a blog to notify followers of its availability. So if you're interested in a podcast, some tips to consider, again, keep it short. The average podcast lasts about 30 minutes, and studies show that the users listen, uh, that users listen to about 22 minutes per podcast, which, not surprisingly, is about the same average amount of time people spend commuting to work, the prime time for podcast listening. Uh, two, respect your audience by taking the time to write a script. Can't emphasize this much, especially if you're doing this for the first time. Don't wing it until you become comfortable with free-form conversation, because if you start winging it and it doesn't come across, instead of sounding like an expert, you're going to come across like an amateur. And three, to maintain a podcast, follow, establish a regular schedule. This is where you'll develop a good following. Uh, decide if, you, if you're going to produce it once a week, once every two weeks, once every month. Whatever you decide, stick to it. You want your audience to know for certain when to find you. And there's some great tools to really help you out with this. Uh, Audacity, it's a free audio editing software that's compatible for both Macs and PCs. It allows you to record and edit. It comes with a wealth of online tutorials to ease the process. There's also Libsyn. Uh, it's an affordable podcast hosting site starting at $5 per month. It offers uh, a wealth of uh, helpful features, including publishing tools, unlimited downloads, and your uh, and your uh, it has podcasts for your own web page. And finally, there's also Stitcher. It's one of the leading podcast distribution platforms, helping drive listeners to your podcast. Main features include mobile device distribution and audience metrics to better understand your listeners. And finally, email marketing. Is use, uh, email marketing is using permission-based email to cultivate relationships with current or potential customers by providing valuable content. The content generally takes the form of a newsletter, promotion, or educational tool. It serves as a great way to stay connected with followers while bolstering brand awareness in a personalized manner. Some tips to consider when launching an email marketing campaign include create catchy uh, subject lines. 33% of email recipients decide whether or not to open an email based on subject line alone. Yet most people treat subject lines like obligations, the last step to take before sending the email, devoting seconds to the thought process. Take your time. Give your subject and line strategic consideration. You want to give recipients reason to open the email. And try to uh, average, try to get between 30 and 50 characters. If you do it any longer, it's going to get lost on the subject line. Tip two, make it easy for potential followers to subscribe. Post a sign-up box on your website's homepage, in your blogs, in your Facebook page, wherever. Be clear with what subscribers can expect by signing up um, to your email, whether it's going to be newsletters, uh, you know, whatever, updates. Just let them know what they can expect to receive. And three, make it uh, reader-friendly. Use bullet points. Have plenty of white space by limiting paragraphs to no more than three lines. Kind of what we uh, touched on earlier with making a page skimmable. skimmable. And uh, for tools with this, there's some great tools out there. There's a, a company called MailChimp. It offers templates for creating newsletters with editing tools for photos, text, and colors. It also offers a spam test to make sure your email won't get flagged as spam. Uh, there's ActiveCampaign. It's one of the most popular email marketing tools for small businesses and organizations. It's easy and affordable and starts at just $9 per month. Uh, features include free email templates, data-driven segmentations, allowing you to segment contacts based on interest and location, and also marketing automation. 
And finally, there's also Constant Contact, great tool for beginners. It provides live on-demand webinars, product tutorials, and user guides on how to launch your email marketing campaign. And it offers more than 400 email templates to choose from, saving you time from having to start from scratch. Pricing starts at $20 per month. So the more you dig, the more you're going to discover that there's really great tools out there. And those tools change all the time. I think that's what kind of gets overwhelming with, with the digital marketing world is there's always somebody innovating. So many, um, there's probably so many that you might start, again, feeling overwhelmed, but you don't want to do nothing. Here are seven easy ways to get started. So again, regarding strategy, without going too far in one direction, take some simple steps on getting an initial read of your online presence. What I mean by that, search for your site on Google and on Bing, and check your social media profiles. Also check any directories or other sites that are not run by your organization that might have content published about you. You want to make sure that it's updated and it's accurate. One of the big one of the big ones I see is with LinkedIn. There's often um, misinformation, incomplete information. So again, check social media profiles, check the search engines just to just to get a read on what your online presence is. And then you also probably want to sign up for Google Alerts, depending on how big your organization is. And what that does is Google will send you an email notification every time some other online entity mentions you. So you can, you can set up an alert for your name specifically, for your organization. Um, there are a couple options there, and here are a few tips included on this slide on setting some parameters so that you don't get pinged for the wrong reasons. So the first one is to start with a, um, a very specific name and include variations. The second is to use quotes to keep groups of words together, and my example there is is the name transforming youth outdoors. I put that in quotes just so that I don't get a Google alert for the word transforming, a Google alert for the word youth, and one for outdoors. You want to keep all those three words together. And then the third is to use a minus sign to exclude words. And the example there is Paris without including Paris, Texas. So if you're wanting to keep an eye on things that happen in Paris, France, and not in Paris, Texas, then you use that format. Now again, Paris is huge. Nobody would probably set a Google alert for something so vast, but that just gives you an example of how to use that minus sign in there to exclude. Um, and then the last is to use the site colon operator function, which limits the search to specific sites. So let's say you only wanted to get alerts on Paris, Texas, as they were mentioned on mytyo.org then you would set the parameter there using site colon mytyo.org and Google will send you, an, again, an email notification of every time Transforming Youth Outdoors publishes anything about Paris, Texas. <laughs> it's a very popular place. <laughs> And so the next, the next easy way to get started is by diving into some SEO tools. Many of these have great tutorials. They also have free trials from which you can really start getting a more solid background in SEO. But the key is getting schooled on how the search engines work. So once you know that, you'll have great insights on where you need to incorporate some of the digital marketing strategies that we've been mentioning. And the ones that I've listed here, Yoast SEO plugin, that's if you've got a WordPress site, there's a free version of that that you can um, that you can add to your site, and then it'll page by page kind of break down where you could, um, I'm sorry, where you could optimize your pages a little bit better. The second is Google Search Console. We'll go into that a little bit later as well. That also um, is a great resource for learning more about how the search engines work, but also how Google specifically is indexing your site and the ease with which it's able to crawl your site. The third is Moz. Um, that's a great, they, ha they have a, a free, what is it, like a 30-day trial, I believe, and then they also have some great content on their site. And then as you start to get a little bit more into the higher-priced ranges, Bright Edge and Screaming Frog are two SEO tools, um, if you've got a budget for SEO tools, that really start to get into deep into the reporting and the analytics. 
And I know that SEO is a hard sell. It's technical, it's complex, and for most, it's painfully boring. It's true. But there are some creative resources out there like this SEO periodic table from Search Engine Land. And that's another site to keep an eye on as well. So Search Engine Land, what they did is they just broke everything down into how a search engine like Google gets indicators from your site and from your content. Another fun resource is Whiteboard Friday, and if you're on the gathering with TYO, you know that I've mentioned this before. So Whiteboard Friday comes from the creator of Moz. His name is Rand Fishkin. And each week, he and his mustache cover a digital marketing topic in a video that's also transcribed on his site. It's 10 minutes out of your week, and it's really worth it. Also, if you follow these guys on Twitter, they also offer some great tips as well. And then here's a simple spreadsheet that you can create to begin conducting your own competitive analysis. So just think of it in simple terms. There's a, you want to pick a keyword or a keyword phrase that you want to rank for, something that you think your users associate with your organization. Then you run a search on Google and Bing and jot down the results in a spreadsheet like this. So here's an example of what I found on page one of Bing when I searched for the phrase Denver Public School for my client Denver Waldorf, which you can see placed 13 for this particular keyword phrase. And you might be surprised where you land and, and you might even be intrigued to click around to see on to see what, re what renders on the sites that appear before yours in the search engine results. Specifically because some of those sites will give you some insight into why they're ranking above yours. Maybe they covered the content a little bit better. Maybe they have uh, more dedicated pages on a, on a particular topic. Maybe they did a better job of optimizing their photos. So not only does this give you an idea or a read where you lie in the search engine results for a particular keyword, but it also um, works as a cheat sheet so you can start to get some ideas off of the other sites that are ranking higher than yours. And then last and certainly not least is TYO's Digital Marketing and Content Strategy Gathering, which we keep mentioning because it's awesome. It's accessible to members of Transforming Youth Outdoors, of course. And here's a screenshot of my dashboard where I've circled the gathering. And you can find it when you're logged in. And then you're going to click on the icon that's in the left rail that's got three white circles. And you'll find Digital Marketing and Content Strategy. And you can join, you can join the gathering. Um, just to get some insights specifically around digital marketing, as we've mentioned. So the value really is that you can access content that we curate specifically for this audience. And it's a great forum for continuing the conversation on digital marketing as it pertains to organizations like yours that aim to get more youth outdoors. And that's what we've got. So we can move into the Q&A. And if we don't get to your question this morning or if something pops up for you down the road, please feel free to email us. We're at jen at or jeff at mooncutmountaincreative.com. And we're happy to help. And of course, you've also got the gathering, which also involves many more folks into the conversation. Um, so we'd be, we'd be so pleased to see you in the gathering as well. But again, reach out to us at any point. We love to help out. We love to help further your mission as well. And with that, I think we'll dive right into the Q&A. Severia, does that sound good? That sounds great. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, jump into questions. So people who are on the call, um, feel free to type in questions that you may have in your question box, and it'll pop up. There's a couple that we'll address. So um, I guess let's for the first one. There's a good one about uh, nonprofit use of Google AdWords. So, you, do you guys see that question? Not yet. So, I don't... Okay. So the, que so the question is: As a nonprofit, we have a grant with Google AdWords that gives us a huge budget that we can allocate towards Google Ads. Unfortunately, they are highly restrictive on what words we can use, and we can't seem to make effective use of this. Have you worked with nonprofit partners in the past with a Google grant? Any suggestions on how to leverage a resource like this better? Hmm. I've got a, <laughs> I've got an opinion on that, and only because um, in some ways there's also a data gathering aspect um, when you use Google tools specifically. So although they've offered a grant, if they're really limiting you in the keywords that you can use, 
you might experience a bit of a bias, which you're probably experiencing right now. Um, and what that means is you're, just like you're saying, is you're very limited. So there's other options to get some insights perhaps on specific what's called long tail keywords. Um, and that's the Google autocomplete. So if you're, if you're finding that there's a shortage of keywords that they're allowing you to use, um, maybe going more specific. And what you can do is when you go into um, your search window and start typing, let's say it's, um, I'll just use transforming youth outdoors again. So if I start typing transforming youth, and I, before I get to typing the word outdoors, you're going to notice there might be four or five um, search results. And those are created strictly through robots. So there's not really any sort of human bias that's placed in that. And it's a truer sense, to be honest, of, um, of some keywords. And that's also a great tool whether or not you have a Google grant um, for getting some insights on keywords and getting some, some ideas outside of that. So I hope that answered, I hope that answered your question. Um, but cool, go ahead and email me, and we can dig into that a little bit more. Cool. Um, and then we have another question question about tools for content uh, that you guys recommended. It was Feedly, Scoop It, and I believe Kapost was the last one, correct, with a K? Uh, yeah, K-A-P-O-S-T. And they're probably just cool. at capitalist.com. Cool, yeah, and those were for um, content, places where you can find content. Yeah, Excellent. for content. Very right. yep. Cool. All right, here's another question. If we are testing our search engine op optimization, how do we account for Google curating our search results and correct for that to get more accurate results? Let me read that question again. <laughs> if you're testing your search engine optimization, okay, how do we account for Google curating our search results? Mm-hmm. Well, you want to start looking at what specifically you're trying to target, so those keywords and keyword phrases. So if Google is serving those to you, it could be a mechanism of, of what you're already giving to them. So, so Google ranks you based on taking a read on your website. So what that means is they look at indicators that you tell Google, this is what my site is about. Um, my biggest example is this. I was working with a client who, when looking through the Google Search Console, which is also a free tool that you can integrate with your site to, again, see how Google is indexing it, um, they were finding that one of their keywords that Google was associating with them was Groupon. And they have nothing to do with Groupon, but what was happening is that they were selling gift cards for Groupon and a lot of their users were going to this particular page, perhaps even bookmarking that page. And so what that indicated to Google was that Groupon was one of their keywords. And so what you really have to do when you're starting to um, audit your existing site is start to look for things that you are telling Google that your site is about. So think blog categories, that's a big one. Um, main navigation tabs. Um, for the on-page SEO, it's the headings and the subheadings. It's how you've named your images. Um, it might even be, another example of this is, it might even be how you're spinning some of your blog posts. And we had another client who um, locally has a very successful gem with multiple locations in town. And he wanted to publish a post about the negative effects of sugar. And when he talked about this with me, I said, well, are you really about sugar? Is that what you're trying to rank for is the keyword sugar? Of course not. He's a gem. He's trying to rank for keys, uh, keywords such as um, Denver workouts, Denver gems, things like that. And so I said, how about we spin that post to better use a keyword? So maybe we can still use sugar, but we should also get your other keywords in there. So, for example, how does sugar negatively affect your workout? or um, just something to that effect. So you can still, you can still kind of reel in some of those keywords without, without only having content that targets, you know, five or ten keyword phrases. Um, but yeah, you really want to start looking at what is it that you're signaling to Google. And again, the tool that really helps with that is the Google Search Console. And if you are on a WordPress site, super easy to integrate. Um, 
you just have to prove that you're the owner of that domain. And so typically if you've got a if you've got a designer that you work with, they can show you how to do that. And then you start looking through the reporting, um, really on crawl errors, any kind of like 404 errors, things like that. It gives you an indication of what Google is reading. Um, and then what's great about it too is that it also tells you how to use their tools, <laughs> which is um which isn't always intuitive, I think. So again, Google Search Console is a great way to is a great way to start. I hope that helped, <laughs> and that that was clear. Awesome. All right, so we have the million dollar question here: How much time each week, as a rule of thumb, would it take to keep your site fresh and effective? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so let's, let's oh, yeah. we break that down into a couple of questions. So, you know, so let's, let's go to the first one is to keep your site fresh. So um, the person who asked the question, John, are you talking your website, your social media pages, or just sort of your social presence in general? Because I think there's probably different pieces to that. Um, so maybe if you could clarify, but the question was how much each week as a rule of thumb would it take to keep your site fresh and effective? So mm -hmm. let's start with maybe that, and then we can look talk a little bit about also how that affects social media as well, or the time okay. spent on social media. I, you know, I would say time is hard. It depends on how fast you write or create content. <laughs> so if you were, um, let's say, if you could commit to one or two blog posts per week, and maybe one or two broad, broadcasts per day on social, that's a great start. And that's where that content curation, those content creation, curation tools come in. Um, the other thing you can do is if you feel strapped for time but you want to be creating new content, is you can start to make a list of who potential contributors might be. Um, they might be audience members, they might be volunteers for your organization, they might be um, one-off people that you might know who might have a particular, um, you know, be a particular expert in subject matter on something. So you don't have to write all of the blog posts yourself. You don't have to create all of the infographics yourself. You just have to learn how to really delegate. So again, I would say at the very least one blog post and at the very least you know, again, maybe two broadcasts on social. As long as, as long as with that, you're driving traffic back to your site. What do you think? Yeah, I, with with social media, it's it's. I would find your strengths, find where your audience you you get your best response from, whether it's from you know uh, Twitter or Facebook, where you, and and then just try to focus on one or two rather than trying to spread yourself out thin and going for Instagram and. Vine and, and, and just everything. So if you could focus, and then once you know where your audience is, like say Twitter for instance, then you can also break down when's the best time to uh, to reach out, and then you can even follow. Uh, you know, you, you, and you can even follow the uh, Twitter chats, the hashtags, see what the content's out there, and um, so yeah, I would just focus on one or two social media yeah. platforms. I think so, and you know we haven't we haven't done this yet, but we've been talking a little about about hosting a Twitter chat just to kind of get some experience about that because it seems to be that you start to really create a bit of a following around a particular topic of conversation. So Twitter chat again, if your audience is on is on Twitter, that's a great one too. But I would say you know kind of just to piggyback off of what Jeff is saying. If you don't know where your audience is interacting on social, it really could be a waste of your time if you feel obligated to participate in social. So your time, in my opinion, is better spent, again, on that foundational portion where you're optimizing the site, where you're getting your main, um, most highly trafficked pages really dialed in with on-page SEO. Um, and then from there, if you have some great broadcasts, if you have some great blog posts, and you could write something, you know, 400 words, maybe that might take an hour, maybe that might take a couple hours. But don't think of it in terms of time, because you'll never do it. <laughs> Just put it on your to-do list. <laughs> I, I read one thing. I read when they, especially if you're doing social media, they said if you're going to delve into that, almost view it like a stock investment. 
know, if you're going to do a stock investment, invest in stocks, so all of a sudden it's like buy it, and all of a sudden two days later it's like I'm going to sell it. No. The only way you're going to get a return on that by having patience with it. And I think that's a great way to look at new social media. Because that's why, and Jen said, you kind, of, you kind of can figure out where your audience is. It's kind of a process, find what works best. The other thing, I'll, I'll just add one more piece to that, is there's plenty of um, guides out there on like the top five Facebook, uh, you know, tips or the best, you know, five ways to get the best engagement on Instagram, whatever that is. And really, there are there are best practices and there are guidelines, but what I have found is that you really have to do that research for yourself with your own customer base or your own target audience. Because let's say that there's a guideline that says, okay, post on Facebook every Wednesday morning between 10 and 12 because that's when X, Y, and Z happens. And if you try that and you find that it's actually Thursday morning that you got a bit more engagement, then maybe that's a better way to go. So you could you can check out some of those best practices, but I would say test, do a little bit of testing on your own. And another way you could, um, another thing that, that might bind you to a bit more of a schedule is if you think about creating a content calendar per week. So maybe every Monday it's um, a Facebook post. Maybe every Tuesday you're posting a short blog post. Maybe every Wednesday you're um, you know sharing a or tweeting a meme on Twitter, something like that, where you've got one thing each day of the week that causes you to have some content to be sharing also. And then people look for that week after week. So believe it or not, Facebook polls are, are actually pretty fun to start to see if you kind of um, give people a choice. You can ask open-ended questions too. There's, a, there's some functionality um, that allows you to do polls and when we were working with dmv.org, that was a that was a huge thing because the the users didn't particularly love DMV related information, but they loved being engaged by some of the hot button items that may have um, may have to do with driving related information. But you can get creative with stuff like that. Well, I love the idea of polling uh, your audience to figure out where they want to get info. Um, how do you guys feel about tools such as Hootsuite or, you know, scheduling tools for your social media planning? Mm, you may take that one. <laughs> you know, it's great. It's great for, again, what I'm talking about, that mapping. If you, if you have a larger calendar, you know, at a glance of what you want to do. But you have to remember that when you've got automated um, broadcasts, so let's say automated Facebook posts, um, you may not be directly engaging. And if somebody's going to respond to a post um, and then you don't get back to them maybe until that evening or the next day or not at all, it's not a great thing. So, you know, I love Hootsuite in that there is some, there is some built-in ease and functionality. But again, the thing about social media is that it's a social tool. And so that's where I know everyone thinks that, oh, it's such a, um, a time sucker. But really, that's the value of it. If you're just if you're just broadcasting, 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 and you're not engaging in some of this conversation, it's really a missed opportunity, and you run the risk of of annoying people, in my opinion, because it's like, oh, okay, now they're always sending out all this information, and it's and you know they're not really engaging in an existing conversation. And when it comes down to um, finding some of those existing conversations, you can think about responding on other on other social accounts because then people start to see that you are part of you're part of an existing conversation and you're also a relevant contributor so that's just my opinion on it <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy if you're not familiar Gary Vaynerchuk and he was a master of this he, he took over his father's uh, wine shop in New Jersey and he started to get on Twitter and he would just find out what people were talking about with wine, he would just search under, you know, Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio, whatever, and then he—that's how he would get involved in the conversation. And this guy, here's this uh, this tough-talking guy from New Jersey, and now he's considered like the dean of of, <laughs> of wine, and uh, he, he just and social marketing and too. social, yeah. And then he and figure out first he got his wine shop going, and uh, and now yeah, like you say, he's the dean of social marketing. It's just incredible what this guy has done, but. Um, but check him out. He just he has some very great tips on how to find out what your audience is talking about, and then using that to gain a following and get in the conversation. 
Yeah, and, and to, to Google what that, it's called social listening. So if you Google tips on social listening, you'll, you'll probably find Gary Vaynerchuk on there. Um, and then also Twitter search. So if you know how to use Twitter search with the hashtags, that's what, that's what Jeff's talking about as well. Fantastic. Okay, last question, because we're almost to the end of our hour. Uh, we, somebody asked, what about buffer? Hmm. I don't, so I personally don't even know what that means, so <laughs> maybe, maybe you can just explain what that yeah. means and then uh, answer the question. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, it's a, it's a tool for, for, um, for kind of hitting a couple different social channels all at once. So really it's scheduling, but it comes back again to that conversation about are you engaging in real time? Um, if you're scheduling your posts for later, again, I think that works. If you are um, going in line with like that, that editorial calendar, that social media calendar, but it's in some ways it's a missed opportunity, but I get it. I, I, I just think that in some ways folks feel very obligated to participate in social media. Um, and unless you're, unless you're creating some really great content and unless you're engaging in those conversations, I kind of think it can hurt your reputation, at least your online reputation. That said, when in terms of online presence and online reputation management, there's an element of storytelling that goes on online. And if you aren't part of telling your own story, um, you eventually will have to dive into that because you'll have to undo perhaps some of the story that's being told about you that's not by you. So again, engagement is a huge is a huge part of this. And so tools like Buffer, I think they might save time. Um, but I would I would give a hand I would give a hand or yeah I would just I would spend a little bit more time just testing a couple different platforms, maybe testing one platform, testing some times that were great for engagement, testing what kind of uh, what kind of content people really responded to, and follow that track. Go, go deeper in that track versus trying to go more broad and hit all of these uh, social media platforms. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for everyone who is on the call. Thank you for joining us today so much. Uh, we hope to see you in TYO in the digital content uh, gathering that Jen talked about. So if you have questions that come up after, please feel free to ask them there. We also will be sending you a link to the webinar recording and posting it on uh, TYO as well along with the presentation. So if you were scribbling notes and didn't catch one of those websites or resources, the presentation will also be shared on TYO as well. And Jen and Jeff, thank you guys very much uh, for filling our toolbox with all those awesome tools. You bet. Thanks, Samaria. All right, great. Everyone have an amazing week, and I hope you're enjoying fall. I'll talk to you all later. Bye.